So it's really my great pleasure that Amy Betts, uh, who we all know, um, will be our moderator for today. So I'll just quickly give a brief introduction about her, and then after that, it's, it's all on Amy. Um, so she's an associate professor and the assistant dean for retention, diversity, and inclusion in Kansas State. And uh, what makes her really one of the best people probably to be the moderator for this that she has really a very strong passion for mentoring and for diversity. Um, so I'm really grateful that, uh, that Amy um, accepted the invitation to, to moderate this. Um, and without further ado, I'll, I'll take her, let her take over. Thank you very much, Patty, for the introduction. So just to give everybody a brief overview of how this is going to work, we have five panelists today and people had sent in questions over the past week and some of these, um, Pat and I looked at, we kind of combined them into a few questions. So first, there's gonna be a, a brief introduction and overview from each panelist that is sort of a question built into it. Then I will ask three additional questions and panelists can feel free to, to chime in where they want. While this is all going on, feel free any audience members to post another question in the chat. If that question doesn't get answered, while we're talking, I'll try to go through those chat questions one by one. Um, and panelists at any time, just uh, as I ask the additional questions, we don't all have to answer each question. So just chime in wherever you want. Um, so, but for the first one, I will ask each of you individually. So for the first question, I just want everybody to give an introduction to themselves, but also Tell me and the audience a little bit about how do you spend your time? And this could be by the day, um, if you have a really rigorous schedule or maybe over an overview for the week. And you can feel free to open up about whether this is pre, during, or as we transition into this post pandemic time. But I think um, people are just always very interested to learn a little bit more about how people are allocating their time and what they're actually putting time into. Um, so Jonathan, why don't we go ahead and try and start with you and then we can also test if you're able to share your slides. Okay, yeah, sounds great. Um, can people see my screen? I see it. Yes. Yep. Okay. You're in the presenter mode. Okay, hold on. Is that better? Yes, that's better. Uh, okay, thanks Amy. Uh, so I'm Jonathan Barrico, uh, Associate Professor at Virginia Tech. I study interfacial fluid mechanics, uh, condensation, frost, things like that. Um, and just giving a couple of slides here on how I balance my family number one with my uh, family number two, right? My lab family. Uh, and then very occasionally, this happens on Wednesday, they can sometimes uh, converge and come together. Uh, so we, we had a fun uh, backyard barbecue uh, on, on Wednesday. Um, so how, how to balance this? This is really hard, right? Um, and, and, and yes, just to, to pre-answer some common questions I get regarding uh, this first slide here. Uh, yes, these are all mine. Yes, it does look like my hands are full. Uh, no, I am not a Mormon, although it would be fine if I was. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, I know how babies are made, just to answer all the common questions <laughs> I get there. <laughs> um, so pre-pandemic, uh, if you just kind of average out my last seven years being on tenure track, um, this is what it has typically looked like since there's always been a pregnancy or a baby or, or something over the past seven years. Uh, so 6.30 to 10.30 a.m., I try to take the lead on the morning routine. My wife uh, tends to suffer from insomnia sometimes or postpartum depression, or she's just sleeping in because she's exhausted from nursing the baby all night. Uh, so I try to be the morning person. So it, it can take about three hours to make, serve, and clean up breakfast. Uh, and then I try to find time to read and play with my kids. Uh, they love going on long bike rides, so that keeps me fit too. So I take the little one and the jogger. The rest, we train how to bike pretty early. Even our four-year-old can ride a pedal bike now for five or six miles. And we just go biking around and uh, have lots of fun. Uh, and then I go into my uh, job from about 10.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Again, on average, this changes wildly over the years. Um, and then 5 to 8, dinner, bath, and bed routine with the kids. Uh, 8 to 9.30, time with my wife and cleaning up the house. And then I spend a couple hours in the late evening catching up on emails or writing deadlines. And if I'm lucky, uh, doing a little bit of reading or playing some piano to unwind before bed. Uh, so I think that was all I really had regarding the, the first question. So I, I think the main thing you're seeing here 
is a bunch of compartmentalizing, right? So you have like my, my four hours of kid time in the morning, then I shift to my job life, then back to the kids, then to my wife, then back to my job. So it's just very compartmentalized. I don't really mix and match it. It's just one thing to the next. Okay, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, Saeed, you're the next on my list. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Saeed Mogadam. I'm a professor at the University of Florida. Started here in 2010. Uh, I have tried different routines over years. And sometimes I've tried to stick to an eight to like five or 6 p.m. And I try to make it work out. And uh, the intention is to make sure that I spend time with family and friends and, and have some time for myself. Uh, but as you know, uh, just to, to be um, honest, uh, the nature of our job is such that it's sometimes it's hard to keep a strict schedule. And that's where we start getting stressed out. Um, and, and because we, we write proposals that have deadlines, papers that have deadlines and dealing with students that sometimes things do not work out, right? So I uh, have um, accepted that actually there are some disruptions and, and I have, uh, I try to communicate those with families, with my family and, and, and if, if I'm spending a whole week focused on, on writing a proposal, I promise my kids two kids that uh, they're going to get some time with, with, uh, with, with daddy next week or weekend and, and I take him somewhere. Uh, and uh, that's my basically um, general principle. And, and when I started as a tenure faculty, obviously I love my job. My job was very important for me. So it was um, uh, not easy for me to cut, finish the job, finish my work at exactly 6 p.m just making sure that I spend time with family while my brain was busy. So I, I have tried to really, when I spend time with family, I try to be 100% with family. And uh, basically, these are the, some of the things that uh, I have uh, tried to develop skills over time uh, to, to be effective at work and family and with friends. Thank you, Saeed. Um, Khalil? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Well, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Spend some time. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, very briefly, uh, I'm a professor at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Edinburgh is in Scotland. Scotland is in the UK. Um, I did my education in France in the early 90s. Uh, after a short experience in France, I moved to the UK in the late 90s, and it has been more than 22 years now at the University of Edinburgh. I work on interfacial, interfacial engineering, heat transfer, multi-phase flows, and so on. Uh, I, during these years, I had experience actually in North America for many years, uh, at the Far East and Europe, of course. And that is important because what I was trying to answer this question, I realized that it can't be answered independently of the local culture of people. So if I'm in China, for instance, I would work on Saturdays and Sundays, which is normal for people to do that. Um, now, in terms of how much time I spend on work and, and family, I have a family, I have a wife, I have two children, two boys, uh, both at university. Um, and I think it has evolved a lot. If you asked me this, uh, this question 20 years ago, I would have told you it would be similar to what Jonathan showed, uh, trying to take care of the kids and at the same time establish a career and perfect teaching and so on. I think over the years, uh, after more than 22 years now in, in Edinburgh, uh, I found myself now doing more management, tutoring, um, um, which obviously early on in my, my career were not uh, a task. Um, uh, in terms of, of allocating time to the family, I, I, what I found helpful actually in the early years is to bring my family in what I do and I get involved in what they do. As an example, for instance, I used to travel a lot. Uh, I can see a few names here from uh, uh, University of Toronto. 
I spent a few years going to the University of Toronto as an instructor professor. I spent many years in European universities and in the Far East. And I used to take my family with me every time I go. And uh, that was a very good experience because that allowed my family to get involved in what I do, the people I know, um, um, and, and so on. And uh, uh, vice versa, I get involved in what they do as well. So I attend their uh, music concerts and their sports activities and so on. Uh, but that, I'm happy to discuss more uh, later with all the members. And then uh, Yoa. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yoa Phyllis, and I'm uh, at the University of Central Florida. I used to be for about 12, 13 years uh, in upstate New York and Federal Polytechnic Institute. Uh, my, uh, I had small kids when I was out the eye, and then they grew up. I moved to uh, Florida, and then I had another kid, uh, a, a little girl. She's five now, so I went through a couple of, this is actually the second cycle. I started with no kids, then we had small kids, then they grew up. When they go up, it's much easier. It's, you, your day becomes much more flexible. And then I went back to uh, be more constrained in, uh, in, in your daily activity. But generally speaking, what I tried throughout the years and throughout the cycles to have a structured midday from say eight to five where I'm devoted to work. And then um, it varies uh, after, after work, you know, first family, and then it does work, and typically it does work, does it may be not so intense, but emails, you need to communicate. I might do it, well, I, I do it, uh, but uh, it's not, it doesn't require so much mental load, like uh, from eight to five, and family comes first after certain time, certain, day, certain time of the day. Weekends are mostly for family, and uh, but occasionally I might do, do work if does if, if need be, uh, and if if it's possible. So I start my day typically around five thirty. I go, I wake up slowly, then I go and have my jog in the morning. I meditate maybe ten minutes. That's my time for myself. No one else. It's, I'm I'm with myself. That's it. I'm jogging. I'm uh, meditating. I come back. I wake up everyone in the house. In the house right now, we have my older son who is a senior in, in high school and my daughter, which is five. I wake everyone up. Uh, then my wife prepares my daughter. My older son obviously doesn't need to be prepared. He might help here and there. And then I take her to daycare. That's my job. That's my time to connect with her. We talk uh, and before we take off, well, after we take off, the first thing I do, I call my mother She's a, a 85 year old um, woman right now alone. So we talk, I talk with her, my daughter talks with her. Um, and then, uh, you know, Orlando has uh, many traffic lights and the traffic lights are, are typically you need to stand for a long time. So I also, once I'm done and when I, when I love my daughter, I can, um, I can do some work actually doing traffic light. I, I send emails, I connect, I communicate, I might call people. And then uh, someone behind me remind me that this is uh, that I'm in, <laughs> I need to drive. So that's what I do in the morning. Then it starts maybe eight, eight, eight thirty, depending on the day. Uh, I you know this is uh, this is where I, I do now. I'm I'm have an administrative position, so I have a lot of interrupts during the day. There's a lot of things going on. Uh, sometimes it takes over. Uh, the dean's for some reason, he loves to uh, connect with me during the weekends or at night. So, you know, I do that, uh, and uh, that's about it. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess you know you got to do what you got to do, but I don't know that I could ever um, get work done during a traffic light. But I think Manhattan, Kansas, is probably also a very different place, right? E emails and co and com communicating with people, not not sorting equations. Okay, <laughs> the 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 low mental energy tasks that come with administration, right? That take our time but not our mental energy. So, uh, in following up to this, because people actually already gave a lot of good examples, but I have a feeling the panel has more. 
Um, can you give some more um, specific examples and strategies of how, um, or some nice stories of maybe ways you've balanced it? And we've talked a lot about um, partners and kids. You'll have brought in that great example of parents, but I know many of us are um, having to deal with increasing, um, you know, health issues and maybe aging parents and how, and some of these things can come unexpectedly, how maybe you've managed um, with some of these situations. Whichever panelist wants to chime in first, or I'll start calling on you if it like takes more than 10 seconds. I, I, I can go first if you want, Amy. Okay. I, I think what I've had to do over the past several years is mentally reconfigure what my life especially my work life is going to look like um, with this new context of a large family. Because like you said, there's lots of things you don't necessarily anticipate, like having you know, grandparents or great grandparents that are getting ill or, or having you know, falling outs between you know, difficult grandparents and, and things like that. Uh, you know, postpartum depression is something very common uh, for a lot of mothers that people don't generally you know, warn you about or tell you about in advance. And that can have a, a huge effect on uh, you know, trying to, to balance out your family and work. Um, so, so I think these are all challenges that, that my family's experienced. And I, I guess I've just had to mentally shift my mindset. I can't have that postdoc mindset of, you know, get nine straight hours, just totally focused and dialed into work and then get, you know, eight to nine hours of sleep every night and have, and have a couple hours for my hobbies every evening. Like, it's just not going to work like that anymore in this phase of life. So it's been very humbling. I've had to I've had to sacrifice a lot of my personal hobbies that I'm interested in, like you know piano and reading, especially. Um, and I've had to kind of accept the messiness of work. Like there's going to be some weeks where I'm going to have 300 uh, 300 unread emails, and there's nothing I can do about it. Like for that week, um, so just just accepting I'm not going to have a clean inbox every day. It's going to be messy. Uh, I'm constantly behind with networking, especially for grants. I, I constantly feel like I haven't even figured out how to do grants and networking well yet. Um, so, so just accepting the messiness of life and kind of having like sort of a, a, a partial dying to yourself, right? In terms of your own kind of interests or, or bandwidth. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a kind of a humbling and frustrating process, but I guess you come out the other end of it a little more with a little more perspective about just like the, the big picture of life and things like that, if that makes sense. Can I just chip in here? Yeah. Um, of course. Yeah. Uh, um, beyond the examples that were given, I think we all experience issues both at work and in family life. And uh, early on in my career, I struggled a lot actually to keep the two separate. So I tended to bring whatever issues I had at work to home, and then those issues will pile on and it, it becomes a big problem. It, it took me a lot of practice, actually, to leave the issues of work when I come back home. It's not easy to do. But I would advise all the young colleagues to try to practice that. Don't bring the problems of the work to your home. That's not a good idea. So if you have whatever issue at work, you have a conflict or, or something pressing, uh, when you come back to your family, you should leave that and, and you go back to it the next day, you go back to office. And, and that's not easy. I know it's easy said than done, but it takes a lot of practice to do it. But once you are able to do it, then you feel like if you're spending the weekend with the family, well, you forget about the problems at work and you go, go back to them on a Monday morning. Uh, and uh, at least my own experience, I found that quite helpful. Uh, can I say something, Amy? Uh, I have a very similar experience, actually. I, uh, there was a time that I was thinking that maybe discussing some problems at work with wife and, and I mean, I have a 12 years old daughter too. Um, it could be something that uh, would help, but I, I realized that actually keeping work separate is very helpful. So, so when we get together for, for dinner at night at 6.30 or 7.00, we just put everything aside and, and try to have a sort of a conversation about other things like family and, and life and, and who is who did what did you do in the morning like asking my kids and how was your day and things of things of that nature i found to be separating my life and my private life and work um has has been something that i found very positive uh, in my experience 
Yeah, and I, so I don't want to take time away, but I'm just going to sort of add to that. And I really find how I walk through the door when I come home has mm -hmm. a large impact on how the rest of my day and my weekend goes. And maybe I might talk to my husband about things going on later that night, but I always try to just at least not have it present as soon as I walk through the door. Because if I walk through the door happy with a smile and the first thing out of my mouth is tell me about your guys' days, it just makes everything much easier. So then my husband has that mental energy later that evening to talk to me about my things, right? And so I just, so even if you can't maybe compartmentalize it all the way, right? Even if you can just hold off <laughs> for a little bit of time, it might make a lot of things go better. Yeah. Okay, I think we can go ahead and move on to the next question. And so this is a really, especially for junior faculty, a very important topic, the art of saying no, right? And so I'd really like some examples of um, what are some things you say no to? How do you say no? Um, how do you decide what to say no to? And maybe there's some variety, right? Depending on who you're talking to, some, so some different examples would be great. So I have a strategy and, you know, um, it's a very difficult question to, to answer, but um, sometimes it do, involves doing little stuff, helping a friend or a colleague and uh, just spending half an hour, one hour. Uh, I, I, I do my best to do it as much as possible, but sometimes it's more involved. And, uh, and sometimes it's really about a career decision. I mean, you are working on some project and all of a sudden somebody brings in a new subject say well this is this has a great potential so I in that case I really uh, uh, think deeply and, and try to figure out how that fit into my whole career perspective and, and see if I this is something that I can tackle. in my opinion this is this is an area that it could really get you off track because big picture things I mean you you are venturing into a new area that could have a great potential sometimes saying no means that you are missing a big opportunity. And sometimes saying yes, it means that you get yourself deep into trouble, completely go off track. So uh, I think it's just uh, like everything else, uh, there are different aspects to it. You have to be, as I said, the, the ones that doesn't take much time. And you know, sometimes you, you might say no to someone that uh, otherwise you could have helped a little bit and, and might have got some goodwill that comes back to an order of magnitude. And, and there are other aspects, depending on your personality, uh, you might really feel very good about helping others and, and building your ecosystem. So uh, these are, I, I try to give some different perspective about how, what's the nature of the, the, the um, additional work that you would like to take and, and how it could help your career and, and others. This is a really important one for me because I'm so terrible at it. It doesn't come naturally. Uh, so, so like back when I was a postdoc, I'd just say yes to everything. I want to do everything. And I more or less could because I didn't have you know kids yet and my postdoc was going very well. Um, so, so this has kind of been the humbling I was talking about, learning the art of saying no and learning that I have like severe limitations now in this phase of life where I can't just do everything I want to. Um, so some quick tips I would give that I wished I'd been told seven years ago when I was entering tenure track um, learn how to say no to peer reviews. I used to always say yes to all of them because I didn't want to like uh, disappoint the editor, if that makes any sense. And also, just, I, I love reading papers. I love it. So my favorite part of my job is, is reading papers. Um, so I decreased my annual peer review workload from about 50 papers per grants per year that I was doing at one point down to 15. And that made a huge difference in just having more mental energy for everything else. Um, I noticed all of my, almost all of my working hours uh, in the office were being spent with students uh, working on improving their writing for their various papers. And I finally realized I developed a very systematic written document that I call uh, the, the technical writing guideline that all my students have to read um, before they write a paper. And now, now I refuse to meet with them for like a sentence by sentence polishing until they've done this kind of uh, self-polishing uh, uh, methodology on their own uh, to, to the point where I feel like it's ready for me to look at. And that's, that's freed up a substantial portion of my time. And more importantly, it develops their skills. I shouldn't be fixing all the writing for them anyway. They have to learn how to do that themselves before I you know, come in for the final polish. Um, I've also had to 
uh, limit my meetings. For example, some years I only have it in the afternoons now, and then my, my morning is totally free to try to attack that inbox or try to get that grant figured out. Um, be more selective with conferences. I'm trying to attend fewer conferences and be more selective there. And then a really important one I've only started doing, if I feel constantly overwhelmed, like just constantly, I have to make myself stop hiring new students. Just say, it doesn't matter how wonderful they are. I'm just saying, no, I'm not hiring anybody until life feels manageable again. So just some tips that I have learned, but I'm terrible at this. I, only in the last two or three years, with the help of my wife, have I even like begun to learn proper boundaries for how to do this sustainably. If, if I may, just, just a quick thing on this one, just from different perspective. Uh, usually what we would like to say no to something, it's because we think it's not a priority. It doesn't fit in our priorities. And uh, when we are in early in our career, I think sometimes it helps a lot to seek some advice from um, experienced colleagues. Uh, I don't know how it works in other institutions, but here we have a, a mentoring system where all junior colleagues have a mentor. And it does help a lot to to have that kind of communication to establish what the priorities are. Because sometimes people say no to things that could be helpful to them later in their career. Does anybody else have any tips or strategies they'd like to share? I guess you know, maybe if I can pitch in a little bit. So it's all about prioritization. Uh, you have to identify if what you ask is makes sense, if, it, if you have the time and who asks it. So if it's a paper review, you know, um, yes, we all want to contribute to the community, but if you get a, a request every day or every other day, obviously you're going, you have to you have to say a lot of no. So um, you don't actually, if it's a paper, you don't always need to say no. You just I shouldn't say that, but just move on. Uh, and pick the, the journals and the papers that really make sense to you to review. Be very selective, like Jonathan said, 15 papers per year. Um, or whatever makes sense to you. If it's someone who is uh, in, a super, in, your, um, admit, in a supervisory uh, position, you might want to be very careful what you say no, uh, especially if it's department affairs, if, if you're asked to be on a committee or then, you know, I, I would be very hesitant to start saying too much no, uh, especially because you're living in a community Yes, if, if you're too busy, it's fine. You can you can every every so often say, you know what, I have too many things on my plate. I really would love to do that, but I just don't have the bandwidth. It's okay to say every so, every so often. But if you turn turn down the requests from faculty, department chairs, associate deans on a regular basis, it might you might want to be careful doing that. Um, so it's priority, prioritization, uh, and always when you turn down, and if, if if you have to, if you don't have to explain, like if it's a, a request to review a paper from some obscure journals that you not not in your community, it, it's there's no need, need to explain. But if it's if you're uncomfortable saying no because uh, it's someone who is in your um, someone you interact on a regular basis. Uh, always put them in your shoes, say, you know, I would love to do this, I have this and this, explain to them, put them in your shoes so they can they can basically make a conclusion by themselves. Saying no is basically, they will say no for you. So that's uh, something you might want to consider. Actually, this is, this tactic is more useful if you, if people constantly, constantly ask you for all kinds of stuff, you know, if you're an administrator, can I get this? Can I have this left? Can I have funds for this? So you, uh, if you can, if it's no big deal, say yes. If it's something that uh, if you do a quick an analysis and say, you know, it's too much time commitment, it doesn't make sense. Uh, then, you know, when you say no, be tactful how you say no. If you have to say no, sometimes you don't have to say no. You just, again, I, just don't say anything. Yeah, just add one more thing along the same line of what you have mentioned. 
I used to say uh, uh, no a lot some some years ago, but I've actually learned to say yes as as I became more experienced, and and that is particularly when it involves to uh, things that comes in the department, college, and university, because uh, that some some yeses actually can can open the the road for you, and and you can get things in return big time. Not I'm not talking about like favor, but but just there is time that your things are going to be, um, some people are, are, are going to be involved in things that you want to move forward. And uh, just, just ha- them having a mentality that you are a positive person that you try to help. Uh, uh, if they may not even conscious, be conscious about, oh, when did you say no, no, but just having a positive attitude towards you gets you uh, really things open up for you and, and things that you have to spend months and months fighting, you, you, can, you can move those things forward much easier. I, I, actually, this is a great point, what you just said, you know, and you also have to put yourself in the shoes of the person who is asking. Yes. So for example, you know, there are some situations that the person is asking for you to do something, this is because they really, really need it. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example. Like when I was LPI, uh, one of the faculty member, members became sick, beginning of the semester. And the department chair was desperate to find someone to go to class. I'm sure it was similar to it too, I think. Then he asked a faculty member and the faculty, actually a faculty member who was very close to the faculty member who was sick. Uh, they told the department chair, so we cannot do that. We're overwhelmed. We, we... Okay, I mean, it was, it was a fair decline. Uh, but then he came to me and he said, you know, and I realized this is, he's, he, he, he really needs help, you know, students need to, uh, so I, I, I said yes, and just because, you know, you have, you have to have this sense of, you're part of the community, of the department, of the college, you, you want to help when you really need to. Sometimes, you know, they might ask you, they need to fill a position in a committee, and probably they don't really care if it's you or someone else, so... Uh, and if you really don't want to do that, you know, you can say no, but also put yourself, before you say no, put yourself in the shoes of the person who is asking. Uh, it, it, this, you know, doesn't, even if they need, that's what I mean, doesn't necessarily mean you have to say yes, but at least put yourself in that position, evaluate how critical this is, and then add this to the, the um, um, reasoning to decline or to accept. If, if, if I just want to add a, a very quick point about saying yes sometimes, um, it's, it's this idea between the short-term view and the long-term view. Sometimes we say no to something because we don't see the benefit right away. In, in my experience, and I'll give an example where you don't necessarily see the benefit right away. Let's say a colleague in another city invites you to give a seminar. And you think I'm too busy, I don't want to travel. Uh, You know, I I don't see really why I should do it. In my experience, sometimes if you say yes and you you make that effort, well, that can turn out to be a very, uh, um, very good collaboration for the long term, okay? Because the short term is is this hassle of, traveling and making an effort and going somewhere and giving a seminar, but we don't necessarily see the long-term benefits. So before people say no, well, they need to think about all these things. That has helped me to become a more of a yes person (laughs) is just understanding that I'm part of an ecosystem. So if a colleague from another unit, so the, the way that, and it's interesting the way it works. I mean, we go through this paper review that some uh, some editor or, or associate editor friend that we know is sending us for review. And, and then sometimes we need them to review something. Sometimes we need their expert opinion. Sometimes basically they write us letters for, 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 for uh, uh, promotion. You get 10 for, for the associate uh, and then 10, 10 for full professor. So this is part of what we do as a community together. And think about other things. I mean, you you, you go to essentially um, uh, uh, basically a comp- to you go to an invitation to provide uh, so your knowledge to to the community. Again, you are helping the community to understand your research better. 
you have to try to understand community's research better so you can really advance the science in your area. So I, these are the things that I've, and then it really even goes beyond what is good for me now or what is bad for me. So it goes beyond uh, actually thinking about just the transactional thing. I think it opens up a completely different perspective that has been, ha has made a difference for me. So I have a, a follow-up question um, that uh, someone sent me, and I'm actually going to ask this to Yoav as a department head, right? So some faculty really, we talked about, you had mentioned this, you know, sometimes you don't need to give a reason, but sometimes you need to explain it. For some junior faculty, they're really concerned about how they say no or what they say no to is going to be viewed by their department head. So, you know, if people say they're, if, uh, if one of your faculty says to you, they just can't commit to something because they feel overwhelmed or because they, you know, are having a difficult time with their family right now, how do you view that as a department head? And what, so what, what do you think of that boundary of information that your faculty member has to? To give you versus when is it better to maybe just let them know you can't right now? I guess it, it depends very much on the personality of the individuals who are involved. One person <clears throat> might have no problem with that, you know, other might. So you really need to know who you're dealing with and their mindset. Uh, you know, if someone were to come to me and say, here, this, I'm overwhelmed, I have this and I have this, you know, um, I would never force anyone, and I typically don't hold, hold it against them, unless, you know, if, if a junior faculty, whenever we ask them something, they always say no. Uh, we're not going to punish them, we're not, but it's not, it, it, it suggests that they're not part of this community, right? They're, they're, they're not feeling that they are part of the department, they are si si silos, they only care. So it, it, it's, it creates bad rap for them, not only department chair, but you know, of course, the, the other faculty. And you want to be careful what I'm saying is, but you know, again, I said, if saying no every so often is, is completely fine. And I think most people will understand it. You know, we all have issues. We're all very busy. Um, it's just a matter of how many times and to what extent and on what issues. So if, you know, if, the faculty doesn't want to teach. So it depends on what you're asking, right? Yeah, and I definitely feel that as an administrator, just so everybody knows, we see a very wide range <laughs> in the responses and sort of the productivity and sort of what people um, commit to when you work with a lot, especially you have how many faculty do you have in your department? So we have about 43 faculty members. And you know, there's always the 80, 90, 80, 90, 10 rule or 80, 80, 20, 80% 80 of the faculty requires 20% of your time. And the rest is obviously, you know. And in my case, it's 95, five, but never mind. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, I think we can, you know, at any point, if people think of more things about this, because I think this is a topic that, um, like Jonathan mentioned, there's a lot of different personalities in it. So while, you know, there's the good consistent messaging of making sure what your priorities are and thinking long term and balancing short term, depending on your personality, some of us need a lot more help with this than others. So if at any point in time, somebody thinks of another way that they've said no, or something they've figured out to say yes or no to, just chime in. Um, this if, is going to be the if last. I, if I can just uh, add to what has been said, I think usually it's not just a question of saying yes or no. It, it, it's a communication issue. And I think the junior colleagues, as well as the senior colleagues, we all need to learn communicating. Because obviously, if your head of uh, the department asks you to, to do something, it's not a, just a, a no or a yes. <laughs> You have to make an argument. Um, and I think we are not all trained or good in communication, but I think we all need to learn it. That's very, very important. Uh, it, could, it could be upward or downward. If you are communicating something to your own students, if you are not a good communicator, well, you don't get the message all the time. Yeah, so you know, actually, this is a good point. What what I what I've observed, we have 
many faculty members, assistant professors that are quiet. You never hear from them. They, they never complain. And on that, and you know, you always have a couple who always, you know, um, but there's very, and there are some in the middle, and, and the middle is, you know, perfectly fine. So again, you don't be too shy to request for accommodation. Just pick your fights, be strategic about them. Don't come for, with any, with every problem uh, requesting help. Just be strategic. And every so often it's fine to do it. Okay, and so for, um... The next question, and this is sort of the last of my prepared questions, and some of you talked about this when you were um, going through your, your time allocation for the day, but talk a little bit about ways and strategies for making time for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I know I specifically, if there's anything, I, I talk to a lot of people that experience maybe like guilt or shame when they take time for themselves, right? And that's something that a lot of us could work on to feel better about and not worry about. So how do you justify the time for yourself? And then what are your strategies and ways that you make time for yourself? I, I can justify that big time, <laughs> big, big time. Because this is the area that I have been working on myself for years. Because, I, uh, because my state of mind impacts everything. It, but from starting from basic things, writing proposals on papers, and down to relations with everybody, including colleagues, fa family, and everybody. So I'm, I, I've learned to be very conscious of my mental state and efficiency. And sometimes my brain is completely cluttered and I, I have to spend time to empty my brain, clear it up. Before the COVID, I, uh, I used to go to gym three times a week. So uh, uh, basically from four, to 5.30 and then take a shower there, go home and go for dinner with, with wife and, and two kids. But uh, right now, basically I go for a walk outside. I do crunches, push-ups, and all those kind of things. But in general, uh, basically when I find myself, my, my uh, brain in a, in a situation where I'm just uh, inefficient, I, not, I can't make progress even though I'm, I'm focused on the my monitor and, and things like that, I immediately quit the work. It could be in the middle of the day and essentially try to do something that my brain actually enjoys. It could be, or, or maybe I go do a heavy exercise for two hours, run and, and do a lot of things. But uh, because you could be spending tons of times on, on, um, on, at work, but you just, you're not creative and, and you're not making progress. At the end of the day, I try to figure out how much really meaningful progress I made. And uh, so that's why I, uh, that I think in my opinion, understanding what's your situation, uh, are, are you stressed out? Um, are you uh, basically, your, your mind is too busy, you have to clear things up is important. The tools that I use, as I say, I exercise, I love watching movies and, and I pick the movies based on my uh, emotional and mental state. And, and say, okay, I really feel this right now. And I think that I have to look at a drama or, or action movie or, or this kind of movie. So if, if I'm down a little bit, uh, I, I really go and, and watch an action movie to get a little bit of energy. And, and I mean, it depends, but yeah. I really use that. And then after, it's interesting, when I come out of that mental state after two hours, I am completely refreshed. My brain has gone two hours in a different world, focused on different things and taking attention from, from the things that was keeping my brain busy. So I, I really just summarize, I try to really understand how, what's the situation with my brain uh, and, and then clear it up. And then I have found over time that um, basically um, people around me are also more comfortable. Uh, because because I uh, I my brain is more refreshed I I I basically I am I'm, I'm calmer and, and those are things that contributes greatly both in family as, as well as at work. Amy, I think if if the question do we need to justify that I think I think um, there are some serious studies which show uh, we are more creative if, if we are relaxed. Um, uh, and I think we need to convey that to the colleagues because what we do in our research, it's about creativity as, as I just mentioned. And we are not creative when we are stressed. 
And the, the, the famous story that we tell here in our university is uh, Peter Higgs, uh, his famous boson idea. He had a seminar on Friday afternoon and he wanted to clear his mind up. He went to the Highlands for work yeah. during the weekend. And when he came back on Monday, he said, well, I have an idea for the boson. Yeah, so, oh, we're sitting here. I'm no, sorry. No, no, no. We're, we're... To, have, to have ideas and to be creative, you need to have relaxation time. Uh, whatever works for people. So I think it's, it's advisable for everybody not to be stressed all the time because you cannot be creative if you, you are stressed. Yes, I think it's very important, but sometimes we have to, even if we intellectually know something, it really helps to keep telling ourselves or to even have other people tell us and remind us. I think for those of us with kids, we can often talk about them like they're just obstacles to our work optimization, right? But this is an important kind of reminder if having um, you know, balance in your life and not just working all the time is actually crucial for sustained creativity and focus in your work, then you can also look at your kids as a benefit, not just an obstacle to your work because every day I'm forced for several hours a day to go on long runs or bike rides, hikes, I'm, having, I'm, I'm laughing and wrestling with my kids. And I think those things are a very nice requirement for me in terms of parenting, but, but also a very nice uh, tactic, if you will, to keep me from just looking at email or a grant proposal for 12 straight hours and burning out. So I, I, I like to think of my kids as actually uh, great leverage for my job because it forces me to go with my gut and to be creative and to not just burn myself out. Does anybody else have specific topics they'd like to talk about? I'm making time for yourself. Okay, I, I don't have any other than Nanad's question, but Saeed, I think you can answer about your favorite action hero when you want. Um, I will just move into then telling stories about all of you until I get another question. So Saeed, I'm just gonna put you on the spot a little bit here. So. Um, one thing that was um, extremely helpful to me is I organized a conference with Saeed. And this was actually, for me, one of the best things I did in my career was um, working on the um, International Conference of Nano, Micro, and Mini Channels as an organizer, because it really gave me an opportunity to work very closely with people on something non-technically related. And you form a different relationship when you're working on something like a conference versus a technical proposal. And one day that was like absolutely amazing, Saeed just shared his screen with me and he was just on his email inbox, right? And I got to see how many unanswered emails Saeed had in his email inbox and I never felt better about myself. I was just like, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> you know, and I think sometimes we also, we lose a little perspective, right? because we can't see ourselves the way other people see ourselves. And so here I am looking at this person who I thought had everything all together and was just so successful and was so organized. And, you know, I am just looking at this going, oh, it's okay, I'll be fine. And then later that year, kind of the same thing happened to me. I was working, I, you know, we had this, this grant for travel awards for the proposal and I show up to the conference and Basically I had to, I was gonna lose my mind. I had everything sectioned out in these little folders and a thing. And I opened it up to tell a person and I just said, oh, Amy, I'm always in, so impressed with how organized you are. And then I went, oh, that's it. <laughs> I have, I've, I've fooled everyone, right? This is, this is fantastic, right? Um, but there is always that um, balance, right? And so I think just getting some more information is always very helpful um, because sometimes we can be very hard on ourselves and it's good to get that additional information so we can really be more effective judges of how we're doing. Or also when people tell us we're doing something very well, make sure we really listen to that and take it to heart, right? Make sure you're looking at the um, positive feedback that you're getting as well. So if people have other questions, feel free to put them in the chat 
And if any of the panelists have any other things they'd like to say or talk about, just go ahead. Um, I'll also give you another piece of advice I got from Yoav a long time ago. And Yoav, you might not remember this, but um, I always, you know, we're academics. I think a lot of us do this. I tend to overthink things a lot, right? I want to give people the very details. Like people need all the information, right? And sometimes I can let this take up a bunch of my time. And, and many years ago, um, Yoav told me, Amy, you don't need to email people all the information. You just give to need them enough information so that they'll stop bothering you about it. <laughs> and I thought this was really great, right? And again, it, it's kind of the, the, the other way of thinking about the other person's perspective, right? What, what information does that person really need to just sort of understand the situation and you can move on or just to justify what you're doing? I don't remember that, but okay. But, uh... <laughs> You gave me this advice and it was very helpful. So I stopped explaining everything about myself and then just, you know, one line emails again that gives some justification, but you don't have to give people all the information, right? Because again, other people are overwhelmed. They don't need all that information from you anyways, right? They just need enough so that they can understand what you did and move on. And it was actually very helpful. And I no longer send people these, you know, wall of text emails, which I think people actually really appreciate. I add one thing to Amy here about um, an advice actually I had early on and it has been very, very useful. Uh, and I still actually give this advice to junior colleagues, which is trying to learn to get over disappointments. If we are in this uh, business, we are bound to get disappointed. You, you're bound to have a paper which doesn't get accepted or a grant that is rejected. And we all actually get disappointed when we get a rejection of any sort. And I think it's important that people learn to get over that, okay? And uh, uh, yes, you, you may not be successful in grant this time, but you have uh, quickly to move on and, and try to go to the next step. Because I, uh, I felt that um, uh, dealing with the younger colleagues in my own experience, a lot of our energy goes into that. Why the grant was not accepted? Why the reviewers are so harsh? Why I don't deserve this? It deserves better. And a lot of our energy goes into that needlessly. So I think it's important to learn. Yeah, if you get something rejected, just move on. That, that helps a lot. Um, so we have a question here in the chat. Um, about um, travel time and leisure time or personal time. And so just maybe talk a little bit about what do you typically do for things like vacation and time off? So we talked about your typical, um, you know, life balance, but what do you do for your vacation? Um, I think I think there is a reference to the UK and the US. I, I know that uh, many UK universities, they have, for instance, one day a week where people can work from home. Okay, it's it's a it's a rule that people use it, and 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 that's that's quite helpful. In terms of travel, I I found actually that the best trips I had are those trips where I go for business, but I take my family with me because I, they get to experience what I'm doing. And um, my, my kids now are 22 and 20, uh, but I took them to attend uh, presentations when they were five and six, and they still remember that, they enjoy it. And I think that I would advise everybody to do it if they can. Yeah, we uh, go to beaches in summer. Okay, so yes, we live in Florida, but we, in general, we love beach. And uh, my two daughters, um, 12 and, and five, they just love to be in the pool all the time. So any, any, any body of water makes their life completely different. And, and that I found, and, and I planned three, two, three trips like that, five days or something in summer starts from June and then July and, and August, early August before school opens up. 
And then we go there and the, the time that we spend on in beach together, we just make so much memories that uh, we discuss about that throughout the year. And so now, then they, they all, I mean, my daughter is like five years old right now is asking, so when, when are we when are we going to, to, to uh, this beach or that beach? And, and uh, so I think that that is very important. It, it, it makes a big difference it, it, you, in terms of connection with, with family and the time that uh, you, you spend off screen and, and very close in a very um, pleasant environment. Uh, I think that, that is, could be quite refreshing for the rest of the year. Amy, can I say something about creating some time for yourself? You, absolutely. <laughs> So a lot of the conversation today has kind of focused on uh, saying no, setting some schedules and things like that. But there are some wasteful activities that I see junior faculty doing, which can be eliminated to create a lot of time for yourself. For example, some of the junior faculty come very proudly and tell me that they wrote 25 proposals last year. It's bullshit. You don't know 25 things. <laughs> I'm sorry. You don't know 25 things worth funding. You don't know them that well. There are many people who know it better than you do. Don't compete in a field that you don't understand just because you can claim that you have written a proposal. I think seven, eight, nine proposals a year in areas that you really know is, is what the traffic will take. And you don't need 25 grants. You, you, you just need enough to keep your program going to the extent that you have the capability to advise the students. So make sure you're only expending effort on proposals in which you have something unique to say. Because proposal reviewers are, are very bright and they know what, what uh, needs to be in there oh, I just threw something together is about the worst thing that you can do to yourself because it not only kills your time now, but it establishes a reputation for you in this community that, yeah, you know, the guy just kind of throws in proposals. So that's one big, huge time saving. Second, um, involve your students. Um, I, I think I said this in the other forum that, that I participated in. I don't start a single document. I don't start a single document. My students do, whether it is a paper, whether it is a proposal. We start with a meeting, kind of just discuss the rough outlines. They do that and then I, I edit and I you know, tear it apart and I fix it and all of that. It is some extra work in the beginning but the student who went through that experience in the first year is going to be much better the second year, will save you time for five, four years for your first year of investment. This has really helped me a lot. And I think uh, Jonathan said something that was very useful that I have a whole bunch of sort of, and I think many of you probably have it too, but it's very important to have some sort of lab operating manual type of thing where you know, I have a template, I have a word style document, which is where all our documents start. You know, what, what font should uh, heading one be and what font should heading two be and so on. And that's the starting point for any document that comes from my lab. And so that cuts out a lot of this nonsensical, you know, word by word editing and so on. The third thing I will say is I don't read the first draft by any of my students. My students give it to somebody else, to one other student, and that student is the one that sends it to me. So at least some of the initial checks, some of the irritating uh, work has already been discarded before it comes to me. And there are many other things that you can do like this, build in efficiencies into what you do, because when you were an undergraduate student, there were things that excited you that don't excite you right now. I mean, I, I used to love coding in EES. Uh, I still do to some extent, but that's not my role. Um, 
let the students do that. They enjoy it. They, they will be the correct party to do that so that you can reserve your time for the more useful activities. So I'll stop there. Yeah, I would like to add to, to what Sirnawa said, uh, which really has to do with efficiency, but I, I, uh, I would like to um, define this as a volume versus quality too. So this applies to what Srinivas mentioned about proposal, but I would like to extend that to papers and even a big picture. The question is that we are in this business, the question is that what do you want your legacy to be after 30, 40 years? Uh, 50 years. Uh, are you solely focused on, on citations? Yeah, there are ways to get citations, right? And then that requires a lot of writing and rewriting and, and writing reviews and things like you, it keep, can keep you busy and consumed. But the question is that, is that how you want to spend your career? And it could basically keep you very busy. But I would like to spend my time uh, mostly on, on, on doing things that advance the science, right? And, and try to, to stay focused and by, be the objective. How is, the, how is this going to change uh, things? Pe make life people better, make people's life better or, or from that perspective. So, and, and when you have that in mind, I have learned that you are more, more focused in writing papers. You are more focused in writing proposals. You just don't try to grab your hand and everything. Sometimes it feels difficult because new ideas, there are not a whole lot of new ideas. But, uh, but sometimes, and, and sometimes it really takes a lot of effort to put even the first paper out, two, three years. But I would say that in long term, uh, junior faculty could be uh, a winner if they really try to focus and, and doing something useful and always analyze that, what, why am I doing this research? And I think that that's very important. Just quickly, what I want to add, I think I, I do agree with the, the arguments made. Um, when people are in their early career, they are under the pressure to publish more, to get more grants, to have more collaborations. And usually that's where they make mistakes. Uh, people are not selective in their uh, papers, in their collaborations. And we all have, those of us who spent many years, we all have a paper we regretted publishing. Okay, if we look back and Every scientist will tell you that paper I published 20 years ago was a big mistake. I wouldn't publish it today. And uh, so I think it's important to set the standards from the beginning. What kind of collaborations do I want to have? Uh, what's the quality of my papers? Um, and this actually feeds in what has been said. It's important. Um, if you set it early in your career, you keep that standard. Can I add one more thing? You know, the way that we operate uh, impacts our community too. So let's say we are asked to be a reviewer in a panel, right? And uh, then what we get impressed, it could be a faculty hire panel or, 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 or a proposal review panel or whatever panel. Um, the question is that what excites us uh, about the candidate or the proposal? Is it metric? Sometimes you see someone has written 100 papers in 10 years, and then someone else 20 papers in 10 years. Uh, I've seen many, many people immediately go and say, this is the 100. They get really impressed with that 100. And I have not seen many people to go and read those 20 papers and 100 papers and see what's, what is the exact contribution? Because there are many ways to, to write a lot of papers. You can chop one research to many pieces or just keep doing lots of papers. So I think that if, if we as a community are conscious about that, we can really develop a feedback loop and we don't get tangled in, in, in that mind frame that we all looking at volume rather than quality and major contribution, make, this makes everybody's life different. Because we have gone to this, this mental state as an as a academia that people are reduced to few numbers. And, and they, they just, they look 
immediately you're Google Scholar, you are this much, and you should be there for better than somebody else that is this. And, and people, some people play this game, but the question is that what is the contribution? So if we want to impact our committee or make our life better, be good researchers, stay, have, stay calm and, and, and take time to, to relax and focus on, on good things, things that Newton and other people do. If you look at papers that are 70, 80 years old, sometimes they'll answer one fundamental question. If you look at Zuber about boiling, he, he put out a very nice understanding and nobody able to essentially completely disqualified or qualified. He just put something out there and I can give you some, some other examples. So this is very important for us as a community to actually shape our community uh, by, by uh, not looking at volume, but at quality and, and main contribution. Yeah, if, if, if I may add here, I think it, uh, this is a very important point. I don't know how it works in the US, but in the UK, every five years we have a research assessment. It means all the universities, all the departments are assessed. And uh, I find it very interesting how the assessment goes. They ask everybody to choose themselves their four best papers in five years. It doesn't matter if you have a hundred, two hundred. They ask you, you select your four best papers. And then you have to write in words uh, why these papers are important, what the impact of these papers. And you have to give evidence for that. Um, and if we put this in our assessment, uh, in our environment, I think it helps people who go back and think about do I want to publish 100 papers or one paper that makes a difference? Um, so, or asking simply the person, what is your contribution? What's the contribution of all these papers? So, I, I, I think I maybe. Um, I, I don't think anyone disagreed that quality is much more important than volume, but that's not always how it works in PNT committees and in evaluation. So we also need to be conscientious about the volume, right? Because many times the individuals who make decisions about our tenure, about our promotion, they are not expert in the field. They, yes, they might read letters written by external reviewers, but that's, uh, that's a factor, yes. But another, an equally or even more important factor is how many papers you owe, how much money you bought, how many students you graduate. So volume is, I wouldn't say volume is not important. It's important for other reasons. It allows people who are not in your community to judge you, which they do. So I, I wouldn't say I agree with what everyone is saying. At the end of the day, what we care about is quality, but that's now how it works always. So pay attention, quality, paying attention to quality is obviously very important, but also don't neglect the volume to some extent. You don't have to publish a hundred papers, but at least publish enough that will satisfy the individuals who are going to make decisions about your promote, tenure and promotion. So, um, just a, a, a caveat to be aware of. Yeah, to rephrase what you have said, that I'm not allowed to <laughs> rephrase, but, but uh, to, to be conscious about what the culture is uh, at the same time that you do your best to change the culture. Uh, basically changing culture, meaning that as, as an individual, when you're sitting in a review panel or you're making judgment about hiring faculty, you take your time and, and do that. Uh, but when it comes to, so I sometimes basically, uh, I, I really try to uh, be, be careful about those numbers because if, if, if I come out and someone that has few papers, right, I, I, people just don't get me serious when, when, I, when I have a, that conversation. So I try to keep a balanced uh, numbers reasonable, but that's not the objective. But yeah, this is really a very good point that you really, at the same time, we are not, unfortunately, we are not living in an ideal world. Uh, while we have to make efforts to change it, we have to be reasonable in terms of um, how to do to advance our career and, and make sure that we could be, uh, we can be influential. Yeah, and I think there's always a tension that exists in 
your long term versus your short term versus the needs of your graduate student versus what your field, right? You know, you have a project, your graduate student did the work, they got results, everything they did was quality, but it's not anything amazing, right? And I don't think there's anything wrong. Again, if you've answered a question and the quality of the work was there and there's some interest there, you know, the student did the work, they should get to publish the paper. Is it going to be, you know, the, but it may, and you also don't always know exactly what things are going to lead to in the future and what it's going to open up to, right? So there is that, you know, making sure you're putting quality out there, but also, you know, understanding that there's gonna be, you know, maybe two or three tiers of papers that you put out there and that's okay too, right? Yes. I've, I've had, had some work like that. Yes, yes, no, yeah, exactly. So just be conscious about that. Mm -hmm. And then you're not gonna be having every single one of your paper be a sort of huge paper that makes major, major conscious. So, and, and there are these factors that you have to, be conscious that you have students that their research did not end up to be a major, major breakthrough. But uh, as long as there is a reasonable thing to publish, uh, basically you go and publish, they need that in under resume. I was trying to talk about situations where we intentionally want to increase our, our number of uh, publication or source citation, just, and, and that's our main focus. And that's what I was trying to refer. I mean, okay. I think the reason we are saying this is because there is a trend that everybody is seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look back to the last, um, at least my experience over 25 years, uh, when we have an opening for a lectureship, the equivalent of assistant professor in the US, well, we used to get people coming out of their PhD postdoc with maybe at best seven, eight, 10 papers. And with time, we started having people just coming out of their PhD with 30, 40 papers, and which is not reasonable. Um, now, going back to the short term, and the, I don't know how it, how it works, but I, I believe that in good institutions, people look for quality. Uh, I can speak for my university. We never recruited somebody because they have a lot of, we recruited people with four papers and we turned down people with 40 papers. So it's always about quality. And um, I've been on panels where people come with tens of papers. And when we ask them specifics about those papers, they don't know because they just put their name there. They don't know the work. And we ask them in the interview panel, how did you measure this in this paper? And it turns out they don't know. They have a lot of papers. They just uh, uh, had their names because they moved from different groups. And we, we look for quality, somebody who has an added value. So. Amy? Yes. Amy. Yeah, this is Andre Federer from Georgia Tech. Uh, uh, can I just quickly, I, I'm going to be really one sentence comment that I, would, that I was listening carefully this one, what is now almost one hour and 20 minutes discussion. And um, I just want to, say it, especially for younger folks, including myself, I consider myself a younger folk here in this group, is that um, uh, with some of the comments from, I think, more experienced colleagues, our senior colleagues, uh, take it with a grain of salt, I believe, personally, because they speak with the experience where they stand right now. If you ask them what they've done when they were at your shoes, trust me, probably many of these uh, bits of wisdom have not been there. And uh, so don't be afraid to, I think, uh, make some of those mistakes. Take good care of yourself, understand what your department wants, be a good human being. And don't be, you know, you know there's a lot of this great advice. This advice came, um, unfortunately, you know, <laughs> unfortunately 20, 30 years, uh, a little bit too late, I think in many cases. And uh, don't, be, don't be so afraid that you're like, wow, I've heard all of these things. I could not do it. It's normal. It's normal. Yeah. And that's all I, I wanted to say, because it can be very intimidating to hear all this great boundary condition and how you create great quality, create legacy. You know, I think there was discussion of legacy. Scary word to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, when you actually build legacy and uh, when you're a third year into assistant professorship, don't build legacy. I personally believe maybe, you know, don't optimize, but and don't get scared, make yeah. your mistakes. I think everybody's different, right? And so I think that's why it's good to get varied advice. 
And then, yeah, you can kind of pick and choose what works for you. But it's important also in that picking and choosing, don't get too worried about some of the other things people have said. If it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you, right? And just sort of do what works best. I think the key word was that being a good human being. I think it's that that's, it makes life for you and everybody around you much more comfortable. And we should not, I try to not lose that perspective. So why am I living and what I'm trying to do and things like that. And the rest of yeah, I apologize for not mentioning that from upfront. <laughs> so now, now, not to consume with these things, but you know, I was just we were just focused on work. I mean, I, I have a perspective about life, and and I would like if I can share with you anytime personally. But I think it's important to really put everything in perspective and see what, why why do we live, and 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 that's a very important question to answer. Okay, and so another thing that um, Andre reminded us of is that we actually have been at this for quite a long time. We had an hour and a half, so there's just a few minutes left. Um, I really want to thank people for all their, their time and insight today. If anybody has one last dying question or comment, now's your chance. Um, I will say Marco, he put a, a comment here. I don't know if it was to, oh, I don't think it was to everyone, but um, you know, it just be kind to the reviewer, to the editors that are asking you for all those reviews. <laughs> it's okay to say no, but they really do need reviewers. I just want to say thanks to the panel. Thank you all for taking the time. Well, uh, we should really thank uh, Patty and Amy, right? Because they they put a, this important they they brought this important topic and make this uh, made this uh, interesting discussion. So uh, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Patty. Oh, thank you, Amy. Yes. Yeah, so. One, um, I'm just going to follow up to something that, that Amy Arconette told put in here. And one piece of advice I really got when I was actually applying for professorships was that the tenure process, and, and sometimes we lose sight of this, and it's hard, right? Because we have all these, you know, we need our job and we need our paycheck, and we don't want the idea of somebody saying that they don't want us. But the tenure process really should be as much about an institution determining determining if they want you, as it should be you figuring out if you really fit into those goals of the institution. And, and Melanie knows this because she worked with me. I really took that to heart. <laughs> and I really um, challenged my institution to decide, do you guys really want to put up with me? <laughs> but I, I felt it was extremely um, helpful for me. And I know not everybody feels that way but as much as we can it can really help a lot to be our authentic selves as much as we feel comfortable with it just just to add i think to what marco has said i think yeah all of this is subjective it's based on experiences of individuals and um, I'm sure in 20, maybe 30 years, uh, anybody else will give an, an advice from their perspective. That's, uh, but uh, I hope it would be helpful to some people at least. Okay, so I think we can be all done. Thanks again for, for everybody's time and perspective. And I really enjoyed this. It was it was good for me. I always like sharing. I think just in general, even if it's just important to share, because the more we get information, the more we can make you know good judgments and decisions. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Amy and Patty. Thank you all for coming. Thanks very much, everyone.